Today's presentation will be given by Lan Deng, um, UM Associate Professor of Urban and Regional Planning and Interim Director for the Real Estate Development Certificate Program at U University of Michigan. Her primary research and teaching interests are in the area of housing, real estate, and local public finance. She's primarily interested in evaluating the effectiveness of government's efforts to deliver decent housing and quality neighborhoods to their residents. And she has conducted such evaluations in both China and the United States. And today she will be speaking on the emerging housing policy framework in China. Please join me to welcome her. I was told I should use this. Does this work? Okay. Yeah, so I'm very glad to be here and thanks to Professor Stan for introducing me. And I think I want to point out that this is a new research area for me. While I have been interested in Chinese housing policy for a very long time, but most of my work in the last decade or so has been very much focused on examining the U.S. low-income housing policies. So only in the last two or three years, I have began to examine you know, housing policy issues and housing market dynamics in China. So. So today I, I will provide an overview about China's affordable housing policy. So basically first I will you know, provide some brief background on the history of China's housing reform, which can help us understand how these affordable housing programs come from. And then I will spend quite some time discussing the three major affordable housing programs in China. So the first one, economic and comfortable housing. In Chinese, it is known as a Jinji Suyong Fang. And then the second housing provident fund is a Zhu Fang Gong Jin. And then the third cheap rental housing is known as Nian Zhu Fang in Chinese. So I will describe what the programs are and whether the, how the program have been working in terms of achieving their policy objective and what challenges this program face. Okay. So again, as we all know that you know China launched the launched the housing reform and may need to address the issues associated with the old housing system. So we know that for a very long time, the China had this public housing system where all the housing units was allocated by work units to their employees as a welfare good. And I, I use the term of work units. Some of you know that the work units often refer to these government institutes or state-owned enterprises. So of course, there are many problems associated with this old system. For example, the rent was too low, so basically just couldn't cover all the operating costs. It was a huge financial burden to the government in maintaining this huge you know, public housing stock and also, you know, housing investment didn't get the priority because under the planning economy, we know that the ideology was always production first and consumption second, and housing was viewed as a consumption good. So it did not get only priority in, in the resource allocation under this planning economy. And as a result, we know that there, serious, there was serious housing shortage. So, so basically, the Chinese housing reform started in the 1980s. There were some small-scale experiments in the early period. But in 19, the first landmark in Chinese housing reform was in 1988. So this was the time when the government launched this you know, national you know, housing reform. And, and as you can see, that much of the effort was focused on privatizing the public housing units, sending them to the families who occupy this unit. And, and there was also effort to try to raise rent you know, to address the issue that the rent was too low and cannot cover the, the cost. But these efforts were not very successful. And more importantly, uh, despite these efforts in you know, privatizing public housing units, reducing the government burden, and during that time, the work units continued to allocate housing as welfare goods to their workers, even in the late 1980s. So, so you have one time, you know, on one side, you have you know, these efforts to try to reduce the public housing stock. On the other side, so the stock continue to grow as a result of this work unit behavior. So this came, this, the second landmark in this in Chinese housing reform was in 1994. So this was the time where the Chinese government realized one. So the housing reform is very important, and so they need to they need to establish a, a more comprehensive framework to address all these issues. So you can see the efforts that were made can be categorized in in these two 
groups. So basically, the first so the efforts that try to address issues on the supply side. So the purpose was to create this multi-layer housing provision system for these different income groups. And one one example of this effort is the creation of this economic and comfortable housing with you know the Jinji Suyong Fund. The, the Jinji Suyong Fund actually had a different name in the very early stage. It was known as Anji Gongchen, but they took this you know this ECH name in 1994. And so the, 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 the goal set up at that time is that you, we, we classify this family into these different groups. So for high income families, so they, they should buy market housing without only support. So for middle income families and low income families, so they should buy these subsidized housing units produced by this ECH project. So that's kind of on the supply side. Then on the demand side, there, there were efforts to try to create this dual housing finance system. And by creating this program called the HPF program, Housing Provident Fund program. And this program was first introduced in Shanghai in 1991. But in this 1994 reform, it became this national policy. So the idea behind these efforts is that, you know, first, you know, families, of course, if they want to buy housing, so they can get these unsubsidized mortgage loans from commercial banks. But besides this unsubsidized mortgage loan, so they can also get some help, you know, subsidized mortgage loan from this HPF program. I will explain more about the HPF program later on. But you can see that the idea is to try to combine all these efforts together to establish, you know, functioning housing market so that, you know, all these individual families could, could could purchase market housing. So as a result of this 1994 reform, so it was very successful on the supply side. There was a, you know, the, so the, the, the immediately following the reform, there was this, you know, construction boom in the early 1990s. And, and, and many development companies were established to build, you know, to, to, to conduct this housing and real estate development. But even at that time, so the work units continued to buy housing for their employees. So, so even though there were for-profit developers that were building market housing, but most of the units were actually sold to these work units, not to these individual families. So, okay, so and these work units purchase the housing and then resell them at a heavily discounted price to their employees. So you can see that this old system still continued on the demand side. Okay. So the third major milestone was in the 1998. So you can see the major efforts were made to overhaul the housing system in response to the 1997 Asian financial crisis. As some of you know that because of this financial crisis, so the, there was a significant decline in the exporting industry in China. So many workers were laid off. So it became very clear that China you know, need to find a new growth strategy to stimulate domestic demand because the, the exporting industry just did not work well at that time. So because of that, so the housing industry was chosen as a new, you know, the engine of growth. So that's why so the government realized that so they need to, you know, they need to encourage more families to purchase market housing and promote the development of the housing industry. So in the 1998 reform, so you can see the work units were prohibited from <laughs> building or buying housing for their employees. So whatever housing fund they had, they should convert them into monetary subsidies. One way to convert them is to put this money into their employees, you know, HPF funding, so the, the housing provident funding. And of course, they can also convert them into cash subsidies for their employees. But we also know that you know affordability was a big issue at that time. So in response to that, the government has also significantly expanded these these two programs I mentioned before. But as a sideline, so the government has introduced a, 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 a sector called the social rental housing sector, which later on became this cheap rental housing program. Okay. But I think so the significance of 1998 reform was very so it cannot be overestimated. Basically, it marked the end of the of this old system. But since then, so there were no major policy changes in Chinese housing policy making. As you can see, that most of Chinese households today have become very comfortable in purchasing housing from the private market. So the market, you know, mechanism dominant in both housing production and housing consumption. And also, we also know there has been, you know, as, as we have observed, there has been significant improvement in these urban living conditions. So as, as a result of these efforts, so we, we know most of public housing units have been sold. So the, 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 the welfare housing segment that has become very small now in China, so they only account for about less than 10% of the urban housing stock. So you see the market housing now supplies most of the housing units for urban households. So 
to summarize China's Southern Reform, there are two features we need to keep in mind, which can also help us understand about this individual affordable housing program. The first thing is that you know China's Southern Reform has followed this decentralized approach, like many of you know its other reform efforts that have been a very decentralized approach. So what happened is that the central government often lay out the framework, lay out the principles and policies, and the local governments are responsible for funding and for finding the land to you know build these affordable housing projects. And because of this, because local governments have to bear most of responsibility, there is a significant local variations in program implementations. And also, I think even though the work units you know, have been stopped from buying or building housing directly for their employees, but work units continue to play a very important role in their housing consumption. And this can be seen, you know, for example, you know, like resource, work units with more resources may be able to provide larger like housing subsidies, cash subsidies, or they may be able to provide more contribution into their employees' housing provident fund. So that so they play a very important role in this process. So there is a very strong inequality in the quality of housing consumption across these work units. And now we know that these days we know that you know China is experiencing a widespread housing affordability crisis and this has really challenged you know the future of the of the country's housing system. So I want to show you some you know graphs. So this is kind of some official data. The official data may have underestimated the problem. But you can see that basically this is just nationwide the, how the average sales price have changed, the average sales price per square meters. So you can see from, you know, in the, from 1999 to 2009, so the sales price has more than doubled. But this is nationwide picture. If you look at this for some you know, big cities, and the problem is a lot more serious. So, so you can see one commonly used indicators in studying housing affordability is to look at a ratio between the housing price to household income. So if you look at this, you know, this, this indicator in the, in the last column, so you can see in Beijing, for example, the average sales price is 19 times as much as the average household income. And so you can also see this for other places. And if you if we think about you know housing affordability in the U.S., for example, you basically you can see that this 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 very very significant contrast. So this is a very big issue these days. And I I would say the data I used was in two was in 2007. So and the problem only gets worse as as many of us know. So to address this challenging, so the Chinese government have these three major affordable housing programs. So basically, and I. So I highlight these three programs and because I think this program must have become the pillars of China's housing policy framework. But I should also note that of course there are other programs that the Chinese government have been creating many other programs and there were many other efforts that, that have been made. But many many of these programs were kind of temporary or some of the programs were very new. For example, I, I know that in the last two or three years, I think the Chinese government have created a program called public rental housing, which is very different from the public housing it used to have. So it was this program was kind of focused on you know helping these young households who they call them like talented workers who have college education who have decent jobs so they live in big cities and because of the housing affordability problem there's just no way that is for these young households to purchase market housing so that but this you know these these people are making good living so they have good jobs so the old public housing stock was the quality was too low for them so the government in the last two or three years so the government has also been building like better quality public housing and this for these kind of young households and you know help the cities retain those kind of workers. But those programs are very new. There are also other programs, like some of you may have heard, like the price controlled or area controlled housing program. But those programs are relatively new. And these three programs have probably the longest history and also have become, you know, have, 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 they have, have, have worked for a very while and has, has, has become very important in, in China's housing policy framework. So I want to explain each one of them. So the first one, as many of you know, that this economic and comfortable housing program, essentially it's a home ownership program. And the program, what the program target is has a very broad targeting, which turned out to be an issue for this program. So you can see that from its beginning, so the program was set up to target both you know, lower middle and middle income urban families who cannot purchase market housing, but those families also would like to become homeowners. They want to own their own properties, but they just you know, couldn't afford market housing. So, the, so, so, the, so this, this ECH provides a way for them to, to do this. 
And most of the units were built by for-profit developers. So, the, so again, you know, work units are cut off from their workers' housing consumption. So, the, so these units were built by for-profit developers and they will be sold to those kind of eligible families. And in, so the way that the subsidy work is that local government would pro provide free or low-cost land as well as weaving or reducing some of the fees and, and taxes in the development process. So in return, so the, this, the UCH sales price would be regulated so the developer's profit were limited to less than 3% because so that, you know, the, 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 so that the unit would be more affordable than market housing. Just to give you some idea about how affordable are these units produced by this program. Okay, so this is just based on some official statistics and this, this nationwide picture. So you can see that we can compare the average sales price per square meters for all residential units versus the, you know, the average sales price per square meters for ECH units. So you can see that for most of the time showing this picture, so the sales price for the ECH units, I think has, it ranges about between 50 and 60 percent of the average sales price for all these all these residential units. So, and but in recent years, because again because of the the, the, the rise in housing price, in market housing price, so you can see that the gap between these have 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 expanded. So, and so so you can just from this picture, so you can see that the ability to purchase you know this ECH unit was in is indeed a, a, a big bargain for many of these you know families. So that's can so that that's why you know there there was very strong incentive for for people to buy this type of unit. So as, as I mentioned, you know, given the background of the Chinese housing reform, as you can see that the program was originally created to push these individual families to the market so that the public sector would be relieved of this housing responsibility. So that so that so from its start, so the program was not created to help needy families. So that's why in the practice, so, so the program later on become very controversial. So I explain you a minute about why it becomes so controversial. But essentially, but the program has made an important contribution to China's urbanization process. So uh, there were many large scale affordable housing development. So some of the picture I, I think and I sent to Ina in the, that was kind of example of the of this development. And also I think the program, as I mentioned, work units cannot directly build or buy housing units for their employees, but they were they are allowed to build this ECH unit for their employees. So what what they do is that they often contract these for profit development companies, contract them and ask them to build affordable housing units under this program on the land that these work units have occupied. Many of the work units occupy a large amount of land from you know the old system. So the government gave them you know, this is a large amount of land, and, many, and, uh, and much of land is actually in very good location. So the so the work units have been taking advantage of this program to provide affordable housing for their employees. As you can see, that in doing so, it can has reinforced some of the inequality in housing consumption across you know different work units. Work units have the land, have the capacity, so they would build more ECH units for their workers. And the work units who do not have the land, you know, or do not have the financial capacity, like some of the you know state-owned enterprises that 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 so they may not be able to do this. So yes, I, I mentioned. So this is this is a very typical project. And many of you probably have seen this in many Chinese cities. So this is a project where the Chongqing University built for its employees. So it's a it's a place I think that's about like 20 miles from the old campus. So that so and so this is part. This is funded as part of the ECH program. So on the land that Chongqing University owns. So essentially, so the, the criticism about the ECH program is that the program has basically just benefited the rich more than the poor. Part of the reason is because as I mentioned, the program targeting is too broad. So it includes, you know, kind of large portion, I think from its beginning. So the program was identified that it will provide affordable housing for 60 or 70 percent of the urban households. So that was can you know, how the program was created. And so even though the Chinese government have been trying to set up some income limits to make sure that you know only those who cannot afford market housing will will, be, will get this unit, but this kind of income limits are very difficult to be enforced. Basically, we know that it's very hard for the government to track how much money you know each individual household has been making. So this has become a very big issue. And another reason is that the units are actually too expensive. I showed you before that about this average sales price per square meter. So that seems to be quite a bargain, you know, compared to the market housing. But what happened is that even though this average sales price 
per square meter may look quite reasonable, but many of the easy units actually have very high development standards. So they actually need a very large unit. And the part of the reason that the, the development standards may be very high that produces large, very spacious units is because, as you can imagine, that many of the high income families also want to buy this ECH unit because of the subsidies behind it. And then I think the developers have been you know, responding to this demand from these high income families, again, because the government cannot enforce this this income eligibility requirement. So as a result, so they use ECH units in the last several years so they have become you know, much bigger and much larger. So, 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 that, so that also makes the, you know, the, the sales price unaffordable for many of the, for, for many of the, the, the average families. And another critical challenge that the ECH suffer is the inadequate investment from local governments. So as I mentioned before that, you know, the success of this program pretty much relied on the generosity of the local governments. The local governments are the ones who provide, you know, the, the, the free land, provide all these subsidies. But as you can imagine, of course, so that means that local governments will not be able to sell their land to more profitable uses. Of course, they don't, they don't have the incentive to do that. So as a result of that, so, so, so the, the, the share of ECH investment have been declining very significantly. So. And some of the more recent actions by the Chinese government is try to redefine the program's identity. So instead of targeting this very broad group, so now the, the, the Chinese government has asked that the UCH units should not, you know, setting up this very strict developer standard. So the, 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 logic, the logic is that, well, if it's hard to enforce this income limit, why don't we just regulate the development standards? If we make these units very small, if we make these units, you know, not so nice, Perhaps that will reduce the incentive for higher income families to buy these units. But I think whether this is successful remains to be seen. But this is just you know, another type of effort that are try to change the program to make sure that the program will only benefit the ones that are eligible. So yeah, I mentioned about you know, how expensive the ECH units are. So this is just some of the data. I think yeah, in yeah, I believe it's from Beijing. So you can see that. So let me let me show you the. So this is the, the average sales price for the ECH unit. So sometimes yeah, people call it differently. But you can see so the average sales price for ECH units are three hundred thousand yuan. So it's, a, it's for the on average. I think this is in Beijing. And then this is the the the, the average sales price for the market housing, four hundred thousand yuan. So you can see, of course, it is still, you know, it is much cheaper than the market housing, but it's still way beyond the affordability for many average urban households in, in the city. And then there is some, you know, the average value for these other type of housing units. So I mentioned about the reluctancy for local governments to invest in, in this project. So you can, this is very clear, so you can see that you know, in the late 1990s, the ECH investment was about, like, I think, about 17% of the total housing investment. And then you can see that, you know, in 2008, it was, it has, this share has declined to almost less than 5% of the housing investment. So that's, this has become a big issue. So the second program I, I, I will introduce is this housing private fund. So basically, the housing private fund is a social housing finance program. So it was borrowed from Singapore. So, it, so it was first introduced in Shanghai, borrowed from Singapore, and, and became uh, later on became this national national housing policy. So the the HPF and ECH are both home ownership programs, so they try to help middle class families to become homeowners. It is a compulsory saving program, so that means it is mandatory. So both employers and employees have to contribute to a HPF fund. So for example, so I think normally I think the contribution rate is set at about between 5% and 12% of this employee's salary. So basically the employees, you know, contribute five you know, five to twelve percent of their salary, and the employers also make an equal contribution, and all this money will be deposited into this employee's individual account in this local HPF fund, and the HPF fund is managed by local governments. So it's not the HP. So each each city has a like HPF management center. So it's not managed by financial institute. It's managed by a public utility. So it's a. So it's a dedicated to all the, so the funding is dedicated, it can only be used for housing purposes. So all the money, so basically for only 
for, for so the, the, the employees can withdraw their savings for qualified housing purposes. These qualified housing purposes may include like you know housing improvement if you need money to do some improvement, or if you, you know if you want to buy a housing unit, so you can withdraw your savings. And also you can apply for subsidized mortgage loan from this HPF funding. And in, and in general, I think the the benefits of so the, so your interest rate will be heavily subsidized. So the interest rate for this HPF loan is was in I think in the last decade or so has been about like two percentage points lower than the interest rate that these households may get from these commercial banks. So it was a good deal. So it saved a lot of cost for for these individual families. And one thing I want to mention is that the program was again was started in the early 1990s. So this was a time where there were just no mortgage lending in China. So the, the banks in the 1990s, so many banks in China didn't want to lend to families because they, they were quite concerned about risk. They did not have any experience with lending to these families. They'd rather you know, lend this money to developers, to develop companies instead of to these individual families. So it was very difficult for for many of these families to get these mortgages from these banks. So, so HPF kind of filled that gap, so it provides a funding, dedicated housing funding for those for those home purchases for those families. Okay. So it, the program has been very successful in accumulating housing funding. So I think the program is probably now the largest social housing finance scheme in the world. Some of the other emerging economies like Brazil, I think Mexico, and, and I think some several countries in Africa also have a program like quite similar to this, you know, housing provident fund. But China HPF is for sure the largest one in this country. I think by 2010 the program has accumulated I think over three trillion yuan savings in this program. So it's a huge amount of money and has also been providing I think over one trillion like mortgage loans to their participants. So really has the program was very important because it really has played a very crucial role in facilitating China's housing reform. As I mentioned before, you know, one major struggle that China had is, you know, how to force the work units to convert their in-kind, you know, housing benefits into these monetary subsidies. So that was quite difficult. So the HPF provided a way for these work units to put this money into their, their employees. The, into their employees, the HPF fund instead of building their housing directly for them. So it provides a way for to help the work units to to make this conversion possible. So so it has and also as I mentioned, it basically has also been a pioneer in developing China's mortgage finance and businesses. And today, I think about 20 percent of the home mortgage loans in China are funded by the HPF fund. So I will explain you a minute about why its future is constrained. So I just want to show you some data here so you can see for this program. So this is the number of contributors. So you can see in 2000, I think today, there are already over 82 million workers have participated into this program. So this means that, you know, these over 82 million workers have been putting money every month into their HPF account. So this, and this is the annual funding collection. So it's, also, it's a large amount of money. And then this is how much, on average, how much each worker has been putting into their account. So each year about 5,000 to 6,000 yuan have been deposited into their individual account. And then you can see this coverage ratio. The HPF is mandatory for the public sector. So basically means every work in the public sector will have to participate. So that means almost everybody in the public sector has have participated as so both the employers and employees have been putting money there. But it requires the private sector to participate, but it's not enforced. So, as a, so there was, as a result, there was, the coverage ratio was actually very low for the private sector. So basically, depending on depending on you know what kind of companies, what kind of firms you're working for, some of the larger firms probably are more likely to sign there to enroll their employees in this program. But smaller ones, you know, with more limited financial capacity, probably just choose not to do. So that's why you can see the coverage ratio was a lot higher for these formal urban employees. But you know, if you look at all the urban employees, so it's very low. Migrant workers, for example, do not participate at all. So, 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 the, so you can see this dramatic difference here. And then the, this issue, I will come back to this in a minute. So about this investment challenge. So you can see, so this is how the program has been working. And then I have been talking about that. So one major benefit of the HPF program for these families is the subsidized mortgage loan, right? You get the mortgage loans whose interest rate is two percentage point lower than market loans. So you can see, so well, how how important this is. So this shows some of the comparison about the, the average HPF loan size versus average sales price. 
So you can see that nationwide, so basically the HPF loan accounts for about 50% of the average sales price. So that means 50% of a home, the, the principal can be covered by HPF loan. Of course, the rest of them, either you have to pay all the money out of your pocket or you have to get another loan from, you know, commercial banks. And many families, indeed, many families actually, you know, they apply for, they call it as hybrid loan or, you know, composite loans, where families apply for both unsubsidized mortgage loan from banks and subsidized mortgage loan from this HPF fund. So you can see, but then you can see in places with very high housing, housing costs so in Shanghai and Beijing. So the, 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 the ratio, the support from HPF loan is much more limited. So you can see only about 20 to 30% of the housing price can be covered by this HPF loan. So that means the rest of the, the family have to apply a large amount of unsubsidized loan from commercial banks. So this is kind of one issue. Another issue is about you know, what a percentage of workers who participate in this program have benefited from this subsidized loan. So if you look at this, so this is a, so, so yeah, we can, we can just focus on this, this last row there. So this basically shows that out of the like 77 or you know, 82 million workers who now put in money into this HPF fund, so at most only about a quarter of them have ever used or HPF loan to help them home purchases. So it's very low. So most of them were just putting money into their fund, but they didn't, they may be able to withdraw it for housing purpose, but, they, but if they're not purchasing a home, if they're not doing home improvement, so their money would just sit there and you just, you know, put into this HPF fund, they would not benefit. And the reason is because the HPF program, you know, in, in providing these loans have very strict underwriting criteria. It's actually a lot tougher to get these HPF mortgage loans than getting a loan from commercial banks. So that's one reason. And of course, the, reason, the rationale for this is they want to ensure the, the safety of the fund because it's, you know, it, it has strong government role behind these programs. They want to make sure that the program would not go bankrupt. So they want, so that's one reason. Another reason is actually because of the rising housing price. If you think about, you know, the, 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 what the, 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 the price trend I showed you before, I think for many of the, you know, many households, especially the young households, the housing price have been so high, it's basically just beyond their reach. So that for many of the households, they just, they just not possible for them to purchase only housing at all. So if you don't purchase housing, then you don't get this mortgage, you don't get this subsidized loan, you don't get any benefits. So this has become a very big issue. But you can also see there is some difference. So you, you can see in Beijing, so the ratio is quite low. But in Shanghai, actually, the, this known beneficial ratio is actually very high. And I don't know why, but I think, but one reason, because I would think, you know, Shanghai, the, I would argue the HPF management in Shanghai is probably the most efficient. It, it first started in Shanghai in 1991, had a very long history, and the, 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 the management center in Shanghai is very experienced. So that may have something to do with that. So, but this also shows that some of the issues I want to mention is about the inequality in this program design. So, basically, I mentioned this already. So, think about you know this about like you know three quarters of the participant workers, three quarter of them were putting money every month into this HPF fund, but the housing is so expensive. So, it's very in the you know in the foreseeable future they just didn't have the only likelihood to purchase only market housing, so they would not benefit from this at all. So in that case, so you can see that they were just, it's, it's, so we could actually make an argument that this HPF program is actually low income households who are subsidized in these high income households because it's a high income households who are more likely to purchase housing, who are more likely to apply for these mortgage loans, while for low income households, they just, you know, didn't, couldn't do this. So that's kind of the, issues. Another issue I mentioned is, uh, you can see the program design is that the contribution is tied to salary income. So, you know, people with higher salary income would get more contribution from their employers. So that's kind of another way that reinforcing some of the inequality, you know, across, across these, these participants and across the work units. And another big challenge in the program faced is the weak asset management. So basically, the HPF fund, again, because the social housing finance program, the government was very much concerned about the safety of the program. And in the early stage of the program, there was actually, there were a lot of scandals. You know, like the HPF fund manager would invest the money, you know, to in, your, in their friends' projects or in some of other things. So there was kind of some, you know, scandals or in some of the crops in, in the use of HPF fund. So as a result of that, so the Chinese government had become very strict in regulating how this HPF fund can be invested. So the HPF fund is huge these days. It's over 
as I mentioned, over 3 trillion yuan, is in, 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 and the cumulative fund is over 3 trillion yuan, but its investment choices are very limited. First, of course, you can provide mortgage loan to your participants, right? So you can provide loan. So that's one way to invest that. And of course, you also have to save some funding so that if your participants want to withdraw this savings, so you have to be prepared, be ready for that. But besides that, so the only investment option, so this, this HPF fund has is to invest in the Chinese treasury bonds. As you can imagine, so the return is very limited. So they can only invest this HPF fund in this treasury bond. And so, so basically, as a result, so that certainly cannot meet this, this demand for this rapidly growing, you know, this fund. So, so that's why I showed you before that. So in the table, there is, so this, this actually shows the size of the idle fund. So these are the amount of money that just sits idle in the bank account, so with no place to invest. So this money are just deposited into the accounts in construction banks. So you can see an, an the share of the idle fund. So. so there has been a lot of debate recently about the future of the program. So one central question is that whether this program is still necessary. Okay, the program was developed at a time when banks were reluctant in providing these long-term mortgages to individual families. But this issue has been solved. Right now, I think Chinese, the banks in China are very comfortable in providing loans to, to these families. And, and the family have also become very comfortable in borrowing from these banks. So the issue is, you know, so now if there, this, 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 this mainstream finance has already become available, do we still need this separate financing mechanism? If we do, if we want the program to continue, shall we address some of the issues I mentioned before? Shall we redefine the program, you know, the program's role? So that's some of the issues. And there have been some recent some experiment by the Chinese government to invest some of the idle fund in subsidized housing development. So the last one I'll quickly wrap up is a cheap rental housing program is a Lianzhu Fund. So this program is very different from HPF and, C, and, and ECH in the sense that this is a rental housing program. It's heavily subsidized. It targeted at this very disadvantage. So it's not, it's not serving, it does not serve these middle class families. It serves these truly disadvantaged like seniors, you know, people with disability and very low income households. So, but as, 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 as many of you know that if you think about the history of China's reform, much of the reform was driven by the, the need to promote economic growth, right? We want, to, we want to push people, families to the market. So we want to use housing development as an economic development tool. We want to relieve the public sector from their huge housing responsibility. So it was very much driven by the need to promote economic development, not, not viewed as a social welfare policy. So that was kind of how, you know, this program, the program I mentioned before had become. But in recent years, I would, I, I would say that the Chinese government have indeed realized that this housing inequality and rise in urban poverty is a big challenge for the government. So that's how the CRH program has become, has, has, has been, has been strengthened and and it got Chinese government have invested a lot into the CRH program. But in the early stage, so, so the CRH program was first created in 1998. So it had a very slow start for the same reason as I mentioned before, because you know local governments would have to provide all the subsidies and, and there was no dedicated funding. So it had a very slow start. But in, since 2009, so the CRH program has become a key component in China's famous four trillion economic stimulus package. So as you can see that this serve multiple purposes. First, you know, you know, building this project can create a lot of new jobs, right? You, we want to promote housing development to create new jobs, create jobs quickly and to address this global economic recession. So that, that's one purpose. And second purpose is we want to provide the affordable housing for this truly disadvantage to address the concern about the you know, social dissatisfaction about this urban poverty issue. So the CRH was a very important component in this stimulus package. So the, and the funding was also secured at the local level. So the Chinese government requires that at least 10% of the gains from land conveyance fee. So these are the fees local governments collect by selling the land user rights to developers. So only of these lead profits, so the local governments must invest at least 10% of this land revenue, the income into this CRH project, as well as you know, some of the capital gains in the HPF investment. Okay. Show you some numbers, so you can see this dramatic increase in investment on this program. As I mentioned, there was, it had a very slow start in the early stage, but then since 2009, so you can see, so each year, so the Chinese government had, you know, have been, have started over 1 million 
units through these programs, through both CRH and the ECH program. I think this is just unthinkable in your country like the U.S. As I mentioned, you know, I, I spent a lot of time studying the U.S. housing policy. I remember when I was reading the paper about you know history of U.S. housing policy. The 1960s was a good time for for housing policy making in this country. And then I think the reason it was good because the U.S. government was able to build over 200,000 units each year, you know, through this government housing program. But then if you look at how many units the Chinese government have launched, it's just unbelievable. But this is not enough. So you can see that the the most recent action, the most recent plan is that in the next five years, 36 million new units of public housing. This public housing is broadly defined. This public housing include both the ECH and the CRH, as well as some of the other new housing programs I mentioned, like the public rental housing, some other program. So it's a kind of a generic term for all these subsidized housing units in China. So the government want to build 36 million new units within the next five years. And then, so basically, and the goal is, you know, according to the prime minister, is to accommodate the 20% of Chinese urban households. But as you can see, so whether this was, was succeed remains to be seen. As, as you can see, as I mentioned again and again, so the, 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 the biggest challenge in this housing policy making in China is, is, the, is the responsibility taken by local governments, right? So because this, again, this is also very different from other countries. In this country, for example, I think, most of the we know most of the welfare spending was coming from the federal government, right? Local government didn't have to pay much of this cost, but in China, so most of this welfare spending have to come from the local government. So whether the local government would have the incentive to do this, so that would decide whether these this efforts will be successful. The most recent news I have heard about this is that I think they have met their goal in 2012, but in 2013, I think the Chinese government, the, I think the the, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development said they will slow down on this goal and they will they won't build you know as 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 this as this was as what was planned here. So they said they're gonna slow down somewhat in twenty thirteen and a part of reason is because many local governments just don't have the money to fund those fund those projects. So that's that concludes my talk here. So now I'm open for questions.